Where do we humans come from? What is our relationship to the rest of nature? How did it happen that the atoms that now make up your brain and body, once widely scattered in orbit around a newly ignited sun, came together in a form that can ponder its origins? All of Earth's cultures have mythologies that address questions about our beginnings. We are fortunate to be living at a time when a testable method of inquiry is revealing details about how it actually happened. The origins story revealed so far is fantastic beyond the powers of mere human imagination. Hi, I'm John Gurchy. I have a wonderful job. I build faces over ancient skulls. The quest for scientific clues about how to reconstruct ancient species has taken me into fossil vaults around the world to study the remains of our ancestors. These studies of original fossils and my commitment to keeping up with the scientific literature on, the, on human origins have given me a ringside seat to watch this fascinating field unfold. In today's program, I'd like to take you through 12 million years of our history in just over 40 minutes. While the field can be presented as a mind-numbing series of dates and scientific names, I'd like to focus on the big picture here, looking at the major factors that shaped humanity through time. Our starting point will be Earth 12 million years ago. Vast belts of forest extended across Africa, Asia, and Europe, and these were home to a multitude of ape species. Among these apes, there was an astounding variety of ways of living, different ways of moving through the trees or on the ground, and a wide diversity of diets. At this time, the world of human beings would seem a hazy dream of outlandish possibility in the distant future. But some of the apes of this time were among the largest brain creatures on Earth. Genetic and fossil evidence suggest that the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees lived between 8 and 6 million years ago. Fossils of this mysterious ape, the last ancestor before the human and chimp lineages split, have yet to be found. All of the creatures on the human side of the split we call hominins. The hominin lineage split and split again as evolution experimented with different ways of being human. The result was a bushy hominin tree with a dizzying array of species, and we have certainly not found them all. These species can be bunched into four major groups, Homo, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and candidates for the earliest known ancestors. Let's take a closer look at this last group, the oldest and most primitive hominins. The fragmentary fossils of this group all from the neighborhood of six million years ago, are so ape-like that signs of their hominin status are faint. Sahelanthropus chadensis from Central Africa, Aurorin tugenensis from Kenya, and Ardipithecus kadaba from Ethiopia. All three share two things, small canine teeth and signs of two-legged or bipedal walking. They share these features with all later hominins. All are incompletely known, but fossils of a later species of Ardipithecus, which lived 4.4 million years ago, include a fragmentary skeleton that allows reconstruction of its body. This body looks very much like an ape's, but with some tweaks that are thought to be adaptations for walking bipedally, especially in the hip and the foot. Here is a reconstruction of the very ape-like hand of Ardipithecus ramidus. The skeleton includes a skull, allowing a reconstruction of Ardipithecus's face. Bipedalism has long been viewed as a strictly human adventure, but recently signs of the flexible backs and extended limb postures that we use in bipedal walking have shown up in very ancient apes that lived before the human chimpanzee split. Does this mean that the last common ancestor of chimps and humans was a biped? There's debate about this, and we'll need more fossils to resolve it.
As we move forward in time from these ape-like ancestors, we encounter Australopithecus. This group occupied about the middle third of human history, living from just over 4 million to 2 million years ago in Central, East, and South Africa. Australopithecus can be thought of as a bipedal ape that could eat anything. Adaptations up and down the body show a firm commitment to two-legged walking when on the ground. Alterations in the hip, spine, knee, ankle, and foot serve to make them efficient bipeds. And they could eat a wider variety of foods because they developed enhanced chewing anatomy. Larger jaws, cheek teeth, and chewing muscles that enabled them to deal with hard and abrasive plant foods like nuts and roots while maintaining the softer food capabilities of their ancestors. This brings up a key theme of human evolution, adaptation to variation in available foods and habitats. When conditions varied, either through time or in the case of patchy resources across space, hominin adaptations often serve to allow our ancestors to roll with the changes. Smithsonian anthropologist Rick Potts has named the evolutionary force that favors such adaptations variability selection. Intriguing evidence that variability selection was operating in these early times comes from the site where the famous Australopithecus known as Lucy was found. As you follow the sediments there upward through time, evidence indicates that the environment varied, but Australopithecus afarensis was able to maintain a presence there through the changes. The brains of Australopithecus were small, only marginally larger than those of chimpanzees. But looking at the surface details of brain casts from the interiors of skulls, some anthropologists have argued that their brains were beginning to reorganize in a human direction. You can watch the hand evolve as you look at the hand skeletons of Australopithecus through time, developing broad fingertips, advanced grip capabilities, and long, robust thumbs, all advantageous in the making and use of stone tools. A reorganization of the brain and the evolution of a tool-making hand would make sense in light of the discovery that stone tool-making extended well back into Lucy's time. Nearly everyone agrees that Australopithecus walked bipedally when on the ground, but there has been much debate about whether they also spent time in the trees. Their skeletons undeniably show adaptations for climbing, but were these being actively used, or are they just leftovers from a climbing ancestry? They had long arms compared with their legs, up-tilted shoulder joints, and strongly built arm and hand bones powered by well-developed muscles. Some see their curved finger bones as smoking gun evidence that they climbed, as chimpanzees that climb have, on average, more curved finger bones than those that do not. Some researchers consider the retention of a body form that enabled efficient bipedal walking on the ground and climbing in the trees for at least two million years as evidence that it was the ultimate Swiss army knife for dealing with patchy or varying environments. The expanded dietary range and versatile locomotor skeletons can be seen as early steps in the evolution of Earth's most versatile mammal. With Australopithecus bodies, males were much larger than females. Among primates, this signals extensive male-to-male -male competition. Here is my reconstruction of Australopithecus anamensis, the earliest known of the species of Australopithecus, known from East Africa. Here is a male of Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis, also from East Africa and widely considered a descendant of Australopithecus anamensis. Here is Australopithecus africanus from South Africa, and a possible descendant with some homo-like features, Australopithecus sediba. As you can see, the heads of these creatures are still very ape-like, with small brains, projecting faces, and relatively flat noses. But if you were to pry open the lips of one, you'd see canine teeth smaller than any apes, and more like your own. The third major group we'll look at is the genus Paranthropus, which lived in East and South Africa between 2.6 and 1.2 million years ago. Paranthropus can be thought of as hyper-Australopithecus. In all the ways the chewing system is enhanced in Australopithecus, that of Paranthropus is even more extreme. Larger jaws and cheek teeth and larger chewing muscles 
all supported by a massively built face. In males, a large crest runs along the top of the skull, which in life anchored huge chewing muscles. Paranthropus represents a branch of the hominin tree that diverged from our own. And these two branches have been characterized as the chewing machine and the thinking machine. Both of these adaptive pathways served to increase the potential dietary range, but they did so in very different ways. The origin of Homo represents the invention of a new ecological niche on Earth. A large-brained, stone-tool-making, long-distance-traveling social carnivore. This is the fourth group we'll examine in this program. It is important to realize that Homo originated during a time of increased environmental variability. Habitats were also becoming more fragmented. If you moved out over a landscape for any distance, you were more likely to encounter a variety of habitats, and there would be a premium on adaptation to a wider range of environments. Homo is widely thought to have originated from a species of Australopithecus. How did this revolutionary transition occur? As with the origin of Australopithecus, it is thought to have begun with a major dietary shift. This shift was assisted by the widespread use of stone tools. Add to this the effects of becoming a carnivore, and you have much of the story of Homo. Stone tool-assisted meat-eating humanized us. We know something about how these early stone tools were used because of the context in which they are often found, butchery sites. Stone tools allowed access to animal carcasses, whether hunted or scavenged. The consumption of animal resources, fat, meat, and marrow, is thought to have removed a nutritional constraint on the upper limits of brain size. The theory goes that brain size in apes and Australopithecus were already at the upper limit of what can be achieved with a mostly vegetarian diet. A richer diet, including animal resources, is thought to have extended that limit. By two million years ago, stone tool butchery was widespread and the average brain size of early Homo exceeded that of Australopithecus. Becoming a carnivore had other enormous consequences for evolving Homo. Transition to a carnivorous diet in a mammal lineage usually involves a drop in population density because a given tract of land cannot support as many carnivores as herbivores. Homo is thought to have accomplished this drop by expanding its foraging range. This hominin became outfitted as a long-distance traveler. Adaptations to long-distance travel include the elongation of the legs, enlargement of the leg joints, and many other changes that humanized the body. These changes did not all happen at once in the evolution of Homo, but were assembled piecemeal over time. Becoming more of a multi-habitat creature was part of this transformation, allowing extensive travel over varied landscapes. Our projecting noses are an example, as they are thought to be a moisture conservation feature that helped allow the addition of arid habitats to the growing repertoire of early Homo. The first fully projecting noses appear in Homo erectus. Yet another consequence of the transition to stone tool assisted carnivory, our faces shrunk. Less chewing is required by a carnivorous diet, and even less with the ability to chop or pound both plant and animal foods with stone tools. In early Homo, the jaws, cheek teeth, and chewing muscles are all reduced, as is the facial skeleton that supports them. In hominins, additional factors thought to have selected for larger brains include further adaptations to unpredictable environments, the advantages of making better stone tools, and the advantages of a more sophisticated social behavior in an increasingly cooperative society. Cooperative social behavior is implied by a reduction in sexual dimorphism in body size in Homo as compared with Australopithecus. There is much less difference in body size between males and females, implying a reduction in male-to-male -male competition. The story of Dominici's Skull IV gives us a glimpse of advanced social caring early on. This Homo erectus individual lived 1.8 million years ago and died with only one tooth in place. 
His jawbone had been reduced to a stick, and he hadn't been able to chew for at least the last several years of his life. How do you think he survived? Many anthropologists think it would have been impossible without social help. To accommodate the development of larger brains and increasingly complex culture during human evolution, development of an individual during lifetime slowed and maturation occurred increasingly later in life. Long childhoods are a part of being human, and this trend can be seen at an early stage in Homo erectus. I'd like to introduce three species of early Homo. Most of the evolutionary changes discussed here were in place by the time of Homo erectus, but two earlier, more primitive species are known, although incompletely, and their fragments show some of the changes we've talked about. Homo habilis lived from 2.4 to 1.4 million years ago in East Africa. Brain size had increased over the average in Australopithecus, and stone tool making and carnivory were widespread at this time. Jaws, cheek teeth, and facial skeletons are reduced in comparison to those of Australopithecus. Were these early members of our genus still climbing? Some anthropologists think so pointing to Homo habilis's curved finger bones and possible Lucy-like proportions. Homo rudolfensis, known from East African fossils between 2 and 1.8 million years ago, shows an even larger brain size, although the face and teeth are not as reduced as in Homo habilis. Homo erectus is known from fossils in Africa and Asia between 2 million and 0.1 million years old. It has been widely believed to have been the first hominin that made it out of Africa, showing up first in the Republic of Georgia and spreading as far as the Far East only a little later in time. The influence of becoming a far-traveling carnivore, coupled with the loss of climbing adaptations we saw in Lucy's body, gave Homo erectus modern body proportions. Bodies were now larger than before and within the modern range a change presumably enabled by richer diets. Homo erectus skulls are strongly built, typically with what amount to eye beams across the top of the skull and in the back of the skull and over the eyes as robust brow ridges. Average brain size is even larger than in Homo habilis or rudolfensis. Is it possible that increasing brain size in early Homo is linked to cultural advances? Most or all of these species made stone tools. Homo erectus invented an advanced stone tool culture that included hand axes and cleavers, which have sometimes been described as the earliest objects upon which an idea of shape has been imposed. Homo erectus also invented fire. But before we make incipient modern humans out of these creatures, it must be recognized that they made the same stone tools the same way over and over again across generations for thousands of years without improvement or innovation. The quirky, ever-changing behavior of modern humans was still a long way in the future.